Well, good morning. So just in case you didn't get your coffee this morning, wanted to be sure that we got a little bit of dance music for here for you, right? How can you not feel pumped up when you hear that? That's great music. And also, if you paid attention, though, some great video shots here of what we deliver to our communities. Excellent service across the country, uh, providing for people's mobility, getting them to work and to shopping and to school and all the essentials that they need to do. Well, welcome to this conference. It is fantastic to see you all. Uh, I know it's been a busy three days already, and yet this is the start of the conference. Uh, for many of us, I know dozens here in the audience have participated in a number of committee meetings over the last couple of days. Of course, the bus radio uh, rodeo has been going on, and that's been very exciting. Uh, I've gotten out uh, to visit and see the site, impressed, and really impressed with the Pinellas Suncoast uh, facility and that expansive area where the rodeo is being held. But most importantly, to see the enthusiasm uh, that our people, that our transit employees across the country uh, are participating in the rodeo, really giving of themselves and their expertise. And the competition out there, at least what I saw, was pretty stiff, pretty stiff indeed. Well, here we are at the bus conference. Uh, there's so much to do. Uh, we're going to have a terrific uh, conclusion to the International Bus Rodeo Tuesday evening at the banquet, uh, but there's a big a turnout of attendees here for the conference. We've got uh, uh, great displays. Uh, we've got over 20 buses and vehicles that are here to see the largest that we've ever had. Uh, it's lots to do, uh, and we're pleased to be here in Tampa. What a beautiful city this is, uh, and what a sight we have here at this hotel. I think you can agree uh, it's a great place to have a meeting like this. So please set aside ample time to go visit the bus displays, go to the product showcase, be sure that you pop in, sit through some of these great sessions, and meet some of the outstanding speakers and guests and sponsors that we have here. So here we begin. You know, major conferences like this bus conference don't just happen. Um, I've learned in my four months on the job on the inside of APTA what it takes to put on a session like this in a conference. And let me tell you, it takes a lot of dedicated, hardworking people to do everything that it takes to execute this. And first and foremost, I want to acknowledge the APTA staff who I've come to know are so dedicated and so talented. So many thanks to the APTA staff. I also want to acknowledge uh, our hosts because we could not uh, put on a display like this in the conference without their dedication and support. Uh, this conference is especially uh, one that uh, is noteworthy. We have both Hart uh, and Pinellas Suncoast to our sponsors and hosts uh, of this conference and they have done a terrific job with their teams uh, to make sure that we're, we're w welcomed here, make sure that events are organized well, uh, conduct uh, the bus rodeo, and really make us feel at home. Representing Hart, uh, I'd like to introduce Jeff uh, Seward, who is the Interim Chief Executive Officer. Uh, Jeff has been uh, previously Hart's Chief Financial Officer since 2011. Uh, he has contributed uh, to Hart by negotiating some significant public-private partnership agreements. Uh, they include, for example, with Megabus, Red Coach, Yellow Cab, all of these intended to expand mobility options for the community and connectivity here in the Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg area. He's currently leading an initiative to expand Hart's regional fare collection system to make it compatible with mobile apps and transit smart cards, and he's an advocate for bringing bus rapid transit to Tampa. Brad Miller is the Chief Executive Officer of the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, which serves the Tampa Bay region on the west coast here of Florida with a fleet of over 200 buses. Under Brad's leadership, Pinellas Suncoast has been recognized as one of the most innovative, cost-effective, and customer-oriented public transit agencies in the United States. The agency has been a leader in fostering successful partnerships between public transit and transportation network companies, which of course is a subject of our conference here uh, as well this week. Brad's a member of the APTA's Executive Committee, and he's the chair of the Florida Public Transit Association. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Seward and Brad Miller. It's like baseball walk-up music. That's awesome. Thank you, Paul, for the kind words. Welcome to Tampa. We are very, very wait, what is that? Welcome to Tampa. <laughs> On behalf of the Hillsborough Area Regional Transit Authority Board of Directors, our staff, who you have seen in, not coincidentally, lightning blue shirts over the last weekend, 
help. Okay, Boston fan. We want to thank you for coming to Tampa. It is an honor and a privilege to host this specific event. And why? It is a fantastic time to be in transit. And a few months ago, I thought that was a cliche, but it isn't. It is absolutely the right time to be in transit. And why? We are being asked to do more with less, technology is changing on a day-to-day -day basis, and we are being asked to do more from our riders and our taxpayers. More. Ten years ago, we weren't being looked at to be environmentally sensitive or aware. The video you just saw shows that we are moving in that direction. HART has become ISO 14001 certified. We are looking at reducing our carbon reduction by the movement of to compress natural gas vehicles and looking at alternate fuel vehicles in the future. Something that I had the opportunity to tell the, the APTA Emerging Leaders Group uh, this past week as they visited HART facilities is, and my third grade English teacher would hate what I'm about to say, but this ain't your parents' transit company anymore. We are being asked to do different things. We are asked to embrace technology with vehicles that don't have drivers. How crazy is that? Ten years ago, that was unheard of. And this summer, we are going to be demoing AV, a pilot AV program down the very streets of Tampa. Fantastic opportunities. Looking at the requirement to cooperate and collaborate with other transit agencies, not just be your own little world in a vacuum. We've reached across the bay, and with the help of Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, with Mr. Miller's group, we are doing one of the first of the kind in the state of Florida regional fare collection systems. Something that was unheard of a few years ago, where someone with one card can move around and through different transit agencies in a region without having to worry about making that transition with fares. It's taking the step ahead and becoming much more agile in the services that we provide. So with that, I thank you again uh, for allowing Hart to host. This is an opportunity to hear a lot of the great strategic options and technologies and innovations that others around the country are doing. And we are very, very happy and fortunate to be hosting this event. Thank you and welcome again to Tampa. Good morning. As Jeff just said, PSDA and HART are working better than ever together to have great mobility for the Tampa Bay area. Just like this conference, we're, have, we're here in Tampa today having an awesome co conference, but yesterday we had the most amazing international bus rodeo over in Pinellas County at our facility at PSTA. I want to give an enormous shout out to the great PSDA staff that I get to work with that put on that rodeo and worked so hard to make that a success. And for uh, the PSDA board that I report to, many of who are here for showing their support. PSDA is very proud to be leading the trans industry in this new mobility paradigm that we're all talking about at this conference. Being one of the first leaders in partnering with TNCs like Uber and Lyft, first mile, last mile programs, and real-time paratransit programs. We have autonomous vehicles coming. We have electric buses coming. We have um, even a wet bathing suit policy over on our side of the bay. <laughs> so I would certainly encourage you while you're here to come check out our system over in Pinellas County. Maybe, maybe just go hang out on a sandy white beach uh, a little bit and certainly take Thank you very, very much for coming to Tampa Bay. Jeff and Brad, thank you. Appreciate very much your hospitality and all of what you're doing to help make this a successful conference. Well, uh, let me talk to you a few moments about our industry and the state of our industry. Without any question, we are a healthy, vitally important, and growing public transportation industry. You might ask, can you share with me your rationale for that, I sure can. First of all, we carry over 10 billion riders a year on the US public transportation network. I didn't say million, I said 10 billion. Very few people in our communities really recognize the enormity of what public transit does on a daily basis 
to get people to work in places that they need to go to. So we are carrying a large number of people. That number is very, very significant, continues to grow in many communities across the country. Let me just tell you a little bit about our conference here. This is one of the largest turnouts in anybody's memory for our bus conference. Let me give you a couple statistics. Over 740 paid registrations as of last night, and I'm expecting more walk-ons uh, today. A rodeo that has 88 participating operators, 43 maintenance teams, and representing 80 organizations. It's an incredible number. Our banquet for the rodeo tomorrow evening is jam-packed over 780 expected guests and participants. It's an incredible turnout, and I thank you and congratulate you for those numbers. <laughs> but let me share a couple other bits of information with you. You know, many of, of you perhaps were at our legislative conference in March in Washington, D.C., and virtually a week or so after that conference, we got the result uh, of the appropriations for fiscal 18 that we've been working on. You very closely with your delegations, our team and APTA working with, with the congressional delegations as well. And we had a major legislative victory that we can be very proud of. The president signed into law a $1.3 trillion appropriations bill for fiscal 18. Included in that was $13.5 billion for public transit, the largest ever appropriation for transit representing a $1 billion increase of last year. And it touched all of the areas that we care about, every mode, bus, bus facilities, rail, state of good repair, capital improvement grants, new starts, and small starts. Across the board, we got an appropriations bill. Quite frankly, I don't think we could have expected a better result. So that congratulations and commendation goes to you, because I know firsthand uh, that you've been working locally, you've been talking to your representatives, <coughs> you've been explaining the benefits of what transit delivers in your communities, and those stories make a difference. It's always the local story that really touches people and makes that difference. We're not resting on our laurels. Fiscal 18 uh, has been a great success for us, and those dollars will begin to flow here shortly, but imperative is that we, we make sure that we carry the ball forward fiscal 19 as well. We're in that process now. Congress has begun the deliberation of the varied uh, appropriations bill. It's important to public transit that we maintain, at minimum, those levels for fiscal 19. Won't be an easy task at all, because there's lots of demands and interests out there trying to take those dollars for other purposes, but we need to continue to make our case. So don't relax. The fact that we were successful in 18 doesn't mean that we can go back and lay on the beach for a while. Maybe you can for a day or two, but not very long. We've got to make sure that we're working hard, uh, communicating our needs, communicating the benefits that we provide as public transportation to get a successful fiscal 19, and quite frankly, set us up for a very successful reauthorization of the Highway Trust Fund and uh, the Surface Transportation Program come 2020. So it's just around the corner. So why else? Well, our membership is growing. We brought on some new members just in the last few weeks, some smaller transit systems that I'm very pleased about. But also, we brought back to the association the New York MTA. Not a small feat. <laughs> New York is back in the APTA family. We're certainly very pleased about that. I personally have had conversations uh, with their leadership, as had our chair, Nat Ford. Uh, they're pleased to be back. Just last week in Washington, we had a two-day uh, a summit on positive train control, bringing our commuter rail agencies to talk about how we can get across the finish line for those deadlines. The MTA was well represented there. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, Ronnie Hakem, who is the managing director of the MTA family of agencies, has made her commitment uh, to join us to be active. She's just now also joined uh, the board of directors for APTA, so we're very pleased about that. We're not stopping there, though. We're so pleased to have New York but we want others back into the APTA family as well. And part of the, our duties as the APTA staff is to work with you to identify those that we need to bring back. But why else am I proud of the year in our, in our industry in terms of progress that we're making? Well, first of all, we are a, an advanced industry in technology, an advanced industry in sustainability. Oftentimes people don't recognize that, but you saw 
Proterra a few moments ago sharing their video, and many of you know firsthand uh, the, the product that they have delivered uh, to many systems across the country. But did you know that across the U.S. today, we have 300 electric vehicles in operation already? Alternative fuels, CNG fleets, 30% of the fleet across the U.S. is compressed natural gas powered today. Hybrid electrics represent another 15% of the fleet. Now, if you compare that to the auto industry, less than 2% of automobiles and light trucks are alternate fuels. That's right. Public transit is actually leading the way on technology. Not oftentimes recognized, but that is the case. There's also a number of opportunities that we have, again, to demonstrate that we're a responsive uh, industry. Jane Williams at FTA has spoken to us uh, at many previous times at conferences, and she'll be with us here today, so you'll hear from her this afternoon and her team. But she has made the point, very rightly so, that we need to conclude the certification process for state safety oversight. I know many of you have been engaged in that. There is a deadline of April uh, 2019 uh, where that has to be done, and it really does threaten public funding, federal funding, if we don't meet that deadline. So I know that, that many of you, again, are aggressively working with your states to make sure that that happens. Once again, it's an opportunity for us to put our best foot forward uh, to accomplish that, that certification requirement. The other is ridership. Ridership in many markets across the country is strong. Yes, we have seen a drop off in bus ridership after a 15 year consecutive rise. Uh, quite frankly, in your own experiences and mine, have we seen anything that continues to go up every single year with a, no plateau or slight decline? That's what we're experiencing in bus ridership. But I will say I'm quite heartened by what many of you are doing around the country to change that direction. And what I'm referring to is reimagining our systems. Countless systems have, in fact, undertaken and implemented comprehensive operations analyses reimagining their, their fleets, reimagining their route structure, improving the efficiencies of those routes, making sure the connectivity is there, making sure that the customer has an easy way to get about. That's having dramatic effect as we've seen ridership increases in those communities rather than declines. It also sets the stage for what we're talking here and it really has become something in our industry that is of vital importance and that is how our industry is changing, adapting, and evolving to the new paradigms of mobility. We don't push those back. We don't deny them. We embrace them. We embrace them because we see there's a great opportunity for us to become far more than simply managers of a fleet. We are true mobility managers. We are true mobility integrators that can bring together communications, technology, service delivery, planning, and execution across the board. I know firsthand, having been in this industry, having worked on both the public side and the private consulting side, that the talent exists in our industry to be responsive, to help make a difference, to forge the new way forward for public transit. The public transit definition is a much broader definition, perhaps, than traditionally we've been accustomed to. I am heartened by what I'm seeing across the country, not only reimagining the fleets, but the experimentation that is going on in community after community, right here in Florida with Tampa, with Hart, with Pinellas Suncoast, up the road in Jacksonville, where our chair, Nat Ford, runs the agency, autonomous vehicle testing, many others that are experimenting with collaborations with the TNCs, whether they be Uber or Lyft. Not all of those are gonna work, we understand that, but quite frankly, even those that do not work provide a base of information and knowledge to us that it's gonna be crucially important as we again forge that next phase of development for public transportation. I would encourage you more than at any time before, make those changes, make the experimentation, develop those partnerships, begin to experiment. That's how we're going to learn what works. Public transportation, our bus systems and our rail network across the country will be the backbone of transit for decades to come. Make no mistake about that. All the technologies are fantastic, but they still have time to go. And we need to deliver people to their offices and to their places of work and to their hospitals tomorrow, not five years or 10 years from now. We need to continue what we're doing, but be adaptable, be innovative, be willing to take some measured risk and deliver what our communities need. We will become more relevant, more important to our communities than ever before. 
So I ask you, join us if you can on the 12th of July in Washington, D.C. APTA will hold the first ever mobility conference where we're going to bring together thought leaders here in the U.S. and internationally to share best practices and ideas about how we too can embrace and be part of this new change. I often have reflected and have said to many of my co colleagues, well, I wish I had another 30 years of my horizon in the industry. And why do I say that? Because this is the most exciting time to be in public transportation. We have enormous opportunities to really shape the course of our future. What is really interesting is people like myself and our chair, Nat Ford, who have been around several decades, know that traditionally public transit has always had to scrape and fight and make its case that we are relevant. And yet we have seen cities across the U.S. one after another demonstrate that when you invest in public transit, you're investing in the prosperity and the growth of your community. If you don't just ask me, ask the business community. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has proposed raising the gasoline tax 25 cents, 5 cents a year to make investments in road and public transportation. Why are they doing that? Businesses recognize having a good public transportation network is imperative. Amazon has made it their priority to select their next headquarters direct access to public transit. They have not said we have TNCs and automation and we're just going to let that carry the day. They understand it takes a comprehensive public transportation network of all modes of all types to help make these communities grow and, and prosper. That's the role that you have. That's the role that each of us has. I know the talent that we have in this industry. Let's work together. Let's write the next successful chapter for public transportation. Let's do it together. Thank you. <laughs> now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you a great friend and colleague, the executive, chief executive of the Jacksonville Transportation Authority and the APTA chair, one who is at the forefront of leading this change. And in this past six months or so that he's been at the APTA helm as chair, he has really gotten things going, not only in Jacksonville, but with his energy and his boldness uh, in, in our country for public transit. So let's welcome APTA chair, Nathaniel Ford. <laughs> Well, good morning, APTA. Good morning. Well, uh, Paul, I think that was a fantastic speech. I mean, and what a way to kick off our, our meeting. Uh, thank all of you. I thank all of you for being here for this important meeting, uh, this International Bus Rodeo and Bus and Paratransit Conference. It's great to see all of you there, here. Uh, you make all of these events uh, as powerful as they are, and so it's great to have you here. Uh, I have to express my gratitude to our hosts, uh, Brad uh, Miller and Jeff Seward uh, and their teams. They've done a fantastic job welcoming us, welcoming us to uh, Tampa. Uh, great job yesterday with the rodeo and we look forward to spending uh, more time with you. So uh, I think Tampa has done a great job in pulling this all together. Uh, what I have to do right now is recognize and introduce what uh, I believe is one of, a, a, one of many great friends for public transportation, but we're fortunate because we have him right here in Florida, and he's our uh, Florida State Senator who represents South Tampa and parts of Southern Pinellas County. Uh, he has served as a transportation officer in the U.S. Army Reserve and is a veteran of the Iraq War. And prior to being elected to the Florida Senate in 2012, he was a state representative. He knows how important mobility is to this community and how important it is for this nation. And so please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming State Senator Jeff Brandis. Good morning and welcome to Florida. It is great to have you here. What a fascinating time it is to be in mobility. I joined the legislature back in 2010 and as a member of the Florida House, I was newly elected and trying to figure out what am I going to work on? What is this area of policy I just elected? And so I went to the single source of, I think, all, all good knowledge for legislators, TED Talks. And began to watch hundreds and hundreds of TED Talks, figuring out what is the big idea that I wanted to work on. 
and I came across Sebastian Thrun talking about self-driving cars. Now, I want you to imagine a freshman state legislator in the Florida House talking about self-driving cars in 2011. It was not the topic du jour that it is today. Um, and they thought I was insane. Why are you bringing this up? Nobody's gonna nobody wants to talk about this. This is so far out there. But I, uh, I called up Google. And I said, Google, I said, look, I want to work on self-driving car legislation. Would you work on it with me? And they said, no, that's insane. <laughs> We're not going to work on self-driving car legislation. You're a freshman legislator that just got elected to the Florida House. Uh, you've been in it exactly six months. And I said, well, look, um, I was a transportation officer. I was in Iraq in 2003, 2004, and I recognized that the one thing that would have made those convoys better for me is if I had not been in them. <laughs> and so I said, I'm going to work on this legislation anyway. And if I get it wrong, I'm sorry. Three weeks later, I get a phone call from Google. And they say, look, we get it. We understand that if we don't work with one state, we're going to be dealing with this in 50 states. And so we'd like to bring the cars down to Florida and work with you. And so since 2011, every year we've been pushing legislation to think about the new world of transportation that we're moving towards. I'm somebody who believes that the world of mobility is going in, in predominantly three directions, and you all are experiencing this. This is nothing new to you. It's getting shared. We can see this with the rise of Uber and Lyft, and not just in vehicles, but in bikes, and, and frankly now scooters, uh, that they're picking up off the streets of San Francisco. We can see this in electric vehicles, originally with Tesla that kind of led to the rise, but now every single major auto manufacturer, every one, is telling you that they're going to have dozens of vehicles on the roads by 2025. Huge charging networks will be available in this country by then. And it's getting more self-driving. There's no doubt that this technology is changing the face of mobility in so many ways. Let me just tell you about a few of the projects that are occurring in the autonomous vehicle space in Florida. We have Ford that just announced a major deployment in Miami. We have, the Vo we have Voyage that just announced a partnership with the Villages. We have Babcock Ranch a city designed around solar energy and, and shared autonomous mobility. We have Starsky Robotics, a, a semi-tractor trailer company that's operating and deploying in Florida. We have, the Jackson, we have Jacksonville, we're talking about moving the SkyTrain and putting autonomous vehicles in their downtown. Hart just issued an RFP on Friday for developments in Tampa. And SAE, the Society of Auto Engineers, are in town just for the next three days, testing and evaluating with the public their perceptions of these vehicles. And we've closed down one of the, uh, one of the upper decks of, of, our, um, of our system to begin to have people have this experience of shared and electric vehicles and, and definitely working on the autonomous side. So since my time as transportation chairman, I've, I've, I've given a lot of talks about uh, to different agencies about where, where this air world is going and how to think about them. And so I just have three little pieces of advice uh, for your transit agencies uh, to, go for, to go forward with. First of all, stop seeing your agency as a system. Systems are static. You need to reimagine your organizations as an organism. Organisms change. Organisms adapt to the new environment. And by far, we are entering into a new environment for mobility. Partnerships are key to the future. You can't do this all yourself. Other groups are doing amazing jobs in what they've specialized in. Figuring out you know, whether it's having to build an app or work with TNCs or thinking about paired shared pickup and drop off zones with cities in order to maximize utilization. The world is moving towards building more efficiency. So see um, and see partnerships as key. Finally, in this kind of interesting time between the lightning and the thunder, where we don't know what's going to happen, but we know something big is coming, focus on maximizing your options. We don't know where this is all going. We don't know when, how, how close we are to getting there. I kind of liken this into driving into the fog. At some juncture, when you drive in the fog, you, you slow down, you, you turn your radio off. If you're in my car, you tell your kids to be quiet. And, uh, and, and you focus on what's right ahead of you. 
I don't think we can make radical plans right now. I think the next five years are just driving into the fog. So stay on target, focus on partnerships, see your entities as a system, or as a, instead of a system, as an organism. The paradigm for mobility is shifting. It's up to us to lead into the future. God bless you. Thank you all for what you do. Thank you, Senator Brandis. And uh, so you've gotten a chance to hear from a local advocate. Uh, let's now bring up a voice from Washington. Our next guest is the first woman to represent Hillsborough and Pinellas counties in the United States Congress. First elected in 2006, she is currently in her sixth term and is the vice ranking member of the powerful House Committee, the Committee on Energy and Commerce. Much of her work in Congress has been focused on creating jobs, keeping communities safe, and protecting the environment. These three issues are key to public transportation. So let's give a warm, uh, apt a welcome to U.S. Representative Kathy Castor. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here in Tampa. I hope you had a, a lovely weekend here in Tampa Bay. When you think, of course, when you think about uh, Tampa, Florida, you think about ice hockey champions. Right? So I, I hope you uh, were able to join in a little bit of the excitement uh, as we march on to the Stanley Cup. Uh, Paul and Nat, thank you very much for bringing the conference here to Tampa and for your leadership. Uh, and I want to thank my partners and Jeff Seward with Hillsborough Area Regional Transit and Brad Miller with Pinellas Suncoast. You truly are. Uh, partners to this community to ensure that all of our neighbors can get to work, can get to, to go shopping. Uh, you serve folks who have physical challenges. And I look forward to very bright days ahead for us as we begin to turn the page and, and maximize the investments that, that are coming down the road. So I'm off to Washington after I leave you today. And uh, I thought I'd give you a little Fed report. Thank you again for the music. That really is helpful on a Monday morning. Uh, but you can't start a federal report without reflecting that uh, it took the Congress way too long to get to the reauthorization and passage of the FAST Act, but good, that was done, and uh, you all have been able to tap into very significant grants uh, through the FAST Act. You work very hard on that reauthorization. And the thing about federal policy right now is you have to be consistent, outspoken advocates uh, for the communities you represent and serve because the Congress is so unpredictable and Washington is so unpredictable right now. Uh, jumping off from the FAST Act, who knew what would happen after the last presidential election? Well, it, the reality uh, sunk in after a while and for people who believe in transit and transit investments, I think we were uh, quite a bit concerned about the very serious budget cuts proposed by the administration. But thanks to you and folks all across this country who depend on public transit and to see the future, uh, we were able just about six weeks ago to come together in a bipartisan way and pass, as, as uh, Paul has said, the most historic investment in public transit uh, since we've been keeping track. So that's a very positive thing, and the credit does go to, to all of you uh, and a lot of my colleagues in the Congress who understand that if we're going to keep this economy rolling along, we have to connect people to jobs and, and build that prosperity that Paul talked about. Uh, so now, uh, now, how we move forward from the omnibus package is, again, do not take for granted what is happening. Uh, in Washington. You've got to keep at it. You, I hope you, while you're here in Tampa, you have some good Cuban coffee, some cafe con leche, and, and take that energy and, and keep at it. Because what we have to do is make sure that those funding levels uh, are maintained going forward. Uh, you've got to bring your members of Congress and show them what, what you're doing. You've got, as you apply for the, the capital grants, new starts and small starts and all the transit formula grants, 
really explain to them how this is connecting folks to their jobs, to their homes, and how you're doing it in a more efficient way, how you're good stewards of the public, of public taxpayer dollars. I know that's not easy. We fly back and forth. We're, we're all over. But members of Congress are going to be home a lot this fall. Probably they, the Congress may finish up a little bit early in July, July, August, September, October. Remember, a lot of folks are going to be asking for votes. Even the candidates that are out there, there are a lot of open seats this year. Educate them now on the importance of the reauthorization of the FAST Act and the high funding levels that were provided in the omnibus bill. That would be time very well spent. You also are on the cusp of enormous innovation. Uh, help capture their imagination. I love the term that you use, uh, reimagining. Uh, this really is a critical time for us to reimagine what is happening. The climate is changing. Uh, folks know that the, the hottest three years on record were 2015, 2016, 2017. I know if you're from the north, it didn't feel like that this winter. Uh, but this is what's happening. You've got, to, you've got to adapt and demonstrate to folks that you understand uh, the changing climate, the, the options and mobility that people are demanding these days, uh, and show that you are really on the move. Uh, for my friends here in the Tampa Bay area, we really have a challenge here. We're far behind. And uh, we need, for the experts here who aren't from Tampa Bay, we need your advice. We haven't made the investments in this community that we need to. And yet, it's, we're growing, we're prospering, but we could really take it to the next level if we can come together and do some things. Look at what's happening here right in downtown Tampa. Uh, we have the owner of the Tampa Bay Lightning hockey team is also redesigning this entire area into something called Water Street. Huge public investment. We're building a new medical school across the street. The Tampa Bay Rays want to build a new ballpark in our historic district of Ybor City. Uh, just north of that, we have an area that is crying out for more affordable housing and property values to be lifted through investments in transit. And if you go a little farther north, we have this wonderful uh, tourist attraction called Bush Gardens. But you have to drive a car to get there. There's no other option. Just north of that is our research university, the University of South Florida, and one of the, one of the busiest VA hospitals in the country, in the Haley VA. And north of that, the roads and highways are completely clogged. They want to add huge lanes onto the interstate. Subdivisions continue to grow. It's crying out for new mobility. To, it's crying out for transit to be the catalyst for a better future. This is the vision we see here, but we've got to make the investment. And on the federal side, we'll be your partner. And I know this is happening in your communities, too. You see the gems of where you've made significant public investment. And now this millennial generation, and yeah, the baby boomers are really don't want to drive all that much anymore. They understand they want to have options. So take the message from this conference today and go do your inspired work to help lift these communities. Uh, I'm counting on you, uh, my partners Jeff and Brad, Janet, uh, I'm counting on you. We really need to turn the page and reimagine re the future of this community and others across the country. Uh, thank you again for coming to the Tampa Bay area. Uh, keep up your consistent, outspoken advocacy for public transit and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congresswoman Castor. I think uh, remarks that clearly and ideas and concepts that clearly we could all take an uh, a important page out of and bring home to our community. So thank you so much. I think listening to uh, the Congresswoman and as, as well as uh, to Jeff Brad Brandis, uh, I think it's just great that we have these leaders that are actually, who understand what we do and are behind us in our efforts uh, as it relates to increasing public transit's uh, role. It also illustrates, uh, I think, what Paul told us a little bit earlier about strengthening our funding through these partnerships, both at a state and at a federal level. This uh, partnership, or these partnerships couldn't be more important than we are uh, than uh, they are today because we are going through, I believe, 
one of the most transformative periods in our industry since the advent, really, of the automobile. New service models, private ride-sharing companies, innovative technologies like autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles, they will redefine how we operate, how we think, and uh, how we serve our communities. We cannot just take this as, as little notice. We need to lead, and we need to help shape transportation for the future, so the choice is ours. Uh, in October, uh, when I became your chair, I laid out five priorities that I thought we needed to focus on in terms of taking transportation, public transportation, to the next level across the country. Number one was to strengthen APTA's role as it relates to leadership and advocacy in this space. Number two was building a workforce that was prepared for the future. Three, leveraging big data so we can change our business models. Promoting uh, enterprise risk management, focusing on cybersecurity and, and the impacts of cybersecurity. And then five, shaping a new mobility paradigm. So advocacy is the first priority because that's the number one thing that uh, we pay our dues. That's what we expect APTA to do on our behalf for our agencies. Uh, it's probably the most important activity. Thanks to many efforts, including a lot of the work of the folks that are in this room, we won a major victory, victory in March when we were able to get Congress to pass a funding bill that actually increased funding for public transit. And as Paul uh, actually said earlier, every part of our industry was able to benefit because of, uh, our, uh, of that uh, funding model and the funding that was given to our, uh, our industry. We were able to do benefits in terms of bus operations, bus facilities, state of good repair, and our high-density high states program. That's all good news, uh, but the challenge is it's just for one year. And so the work continues in terms of that effort. We must continue our av advocacy efforts at the local level as well as at the federal level, and we need to focus on next year. We need a solvent highway trust fund. That means funding for public transportation. So we've started the work already to begin developing also the re, uh, our reauthorization plan, because the FAST Act is expiring in 2020, so we need to have a funding bill in place. That way we have sustainable funding going into the future. This demands that we all work together, large systems, small systems, rail, bus, suburban, rural, urban, we have to work together. The second priority was building this workforce that we need for the future. As I mentioned earlier, transformative time is going to require us to have uh, individuals, our team members, our employees, our staff, our leadership to be well developed and be able to embrace all of this technology that's coming our way, this new world that's coming our way. And so we need a highly skilled workforce. This shift will require new skills. Our technicians, our operators, our customer service uh, staff, their jobs in, uh, are going to change over the future. Two weeks ago, I'm pleased to say that we held a workforce summit in DC, the first of its kind, where we shared news about APTA's pilot programs for online education as well as certification. So we are formalizing our training programs. We've made tremendous progress establishing the framework for APTA to begin this training certification program, and it will be completed this summer. And in the coming months, we will actually be uh, setting up an APTA Workforce Development Center which will be a focal point. So we have begun the work in terms of developing that workforce in partnership, developing that workforce for the future. The third priority was leveraging big data. We collect reams and reams of data as transit authorities. Uh, and we not, need to continue to collect, but we also need to uh, assess that data in ways that we haven't done in the past. How do we take that data and use it to tell our stories about positive outcomes that don't just add up in our fare boxes, that don't just add up in seats on our buses and on our trains, but add up in outcomes that are outside of our transit agencies as it relates to healthcare, education, economic vitality. Those are the true measurements of the work that you do. So for starters, we redesigned APTA's annual fact book to begin that process so that our readers can easy, easily visualize this data that we collect and understand their investment, either riding our systems or as taxpayers, their investments in our systems and what are the outcomes that we're providing. It also will share with you the work that we're doing as we, uh, as we continue to make more sustainable and environmentally friendly uh, transit vehicles. 
the work that we're doing as it relates to hybrid vehicles and CNG vehicles and electric vehicles, a point that since 2009, we have tripled the number of vehicles in our fleets that are using sustainable alternative fuels. How using car, uh, how transit actually helps us reduce car travel and which the result is carbon emissions that continue to grow. And how that public transit is much more accessible and popular than it's ever been. So we also use this data to help update the APTA footprint uh, so we could better illustrate the substantial number of jobs that we create, not just in our communities, but that when we buy a bus here in Pinellas or in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, lo uh, in Tampa, when we buy a bus and that bus is on the street here in Tampa, the jobs that it creates across the country because of the components that go into that vehicle to help build that vehicle. So we not only create jobs in our community, we're creating jobs around the nation. And more work is underway in that regard. So there are focus groups that are working right now to collect data and to help us learn more about the, how we collect data and how we, uh, some of us are using those best practices uh, right now to leverage that data. We also are studying how that transit systems can start monetizing that data. That is another potential revenue opportunity for our systems. And then there's a voluntary bunch benchmarking program that's being developed to allow transit systems of similar size, comparing apples to apples, benchmarking best practices across the country in terms of our operations. The fourth priority is promoting enterprise risk management. Safety and security will never not be a priority, I think, for this association. It's at the very front of what we do, making sure that we're operating safe and secure transit systems. And here's what we've done so far. As it relates to cybersecurity, we need to really get a good understanding of what are some of the vulnerabilities that we have in our systems. As we have become more customer friendly with real-time passenger information, Wi-Fi on our bus fleets, uh, implementing uh, mobile ticketing, for example, and all of the technology that our customers are demanding today, have we opened ourselves up to greater risk in terms of cybersecurity? And how do we collectively as an industry get our hands around that, share best practices, and implement those safeguards that our citizens, our customers, our employees uh, expect us to have? I'm pleased to announce that APTA and TSA will host a new cyber workshop at the APTA offices on July 13th. And I think you may have heard a July theme here, uh, July 12th is the mobility uh, workshop uh, and summit that we're having, and right on the heels of that, we'll be talking about cybersecurity on July 13th. That final, fifth and final priority is the shaping of this new mobility paradigm. You've heard earlier speakers talk about that new mobility paradigm, and I, 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 I love the way Senator Brandis captured that in terms of driving in the fog, because it truly is. And some of us are doing a great job of driving through this change and, 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 and we need to share some of those successes. These emerging technologies are evolving our customers' preferences. They want door-to-door -door service. They want it frequent. They want it reliable. And it's changing the way that we need to del deliver services. But one thing that they're also doing as it relates to this new mobility paradigm, they don't see the bright lines between a sidewalk, a bike lane, our bus, a rail car, they, they want that to be seamless, they want it to be holistic, and they want it all talking to each other. And I think that is where there is the greatest opportunity for us as public transportation uh, executives, professionals, and leaders, and practitioners. So uh, we have a great opportunity in front of us. We are the infrastructure. We are the backbone for this. And so again, July 12th, mark that on your calendars. We are really launching, I think, the first major meeting that is going to solely focus on how do we transform our current public transportation systems to becoming mobility integrators with a new mindset and a new great opportunity ahead of us. In addition to that meeting, that's going to be at the APTA offices in Washington, D.C., again on July 12th. And so we will uh, you know, expect to see as many of you as we can and uh, to be there. In addition to that event, we have established a mobility innovation hub. So you don't have to go too far to look and see what transit systems around the country are doing in terms of embracing this new mobility paradigm. And so APTA's Mobility Innovation Hub will be a website that will have cutting edge content so you can go right to that website and then uh, lead yourself to uh, the particular innovation that you need to study. This resource center will be launched in the next few months and will provide you with the resource.
resources you need. Much of that content uh, will link up with the National Center for Mobility Management's uh, redesigned website, which is, is focusing on mobility uh, management. The, um, one of the most important things in terms of this priority is to share those examples. Paul talked about how we need to do things differently, how to experiment, and how to embrace this new future, and I think that infrastructure will help you do it in a confident way. Across the country, and from coast, coast to coast, there are shining examples of agencies that are reimagining bus services, uh, that are looking at mobility on demand projects, and they are also developing what we call microtransit. For example, in Arizona, Nevada, and Florida, uh, you've already heard there's a lot of work that is occurring around autonomous vehicles, particularly here in Florida, using radar, LIDAR, GPS, cameras, you name it, ultrasonic sensors, helping guide autonomous vehicles on our road infrastructure. Automated vehicles are being utilized in circulator systems. They're used in light, uh, last and first mile uh, connections, AV operations, as well as connecting folks in terms of on-demand service uh, routes. Transit agencies are also forming partnerships, and I congratulate the folks in Dallas, San Francisco, Atlanta, Miami that are working on first and last mile projects. I understand St. Petersburg, Florida right here is working on uh, low density pilot and Boston and York, Pennsylvania have dem demand response pilots. So we're gonna aggregate all of that information so that you don't have to search too far and APT is gonna take the lead in being the aggregator for all of this information. In Jacksonville, we're experimenting, uh, experimenting with taxis and sponsor services. We recently replaced several of our low productivity community shuttles. These are community shuttles that we've been operating for decades because we do not want to abandon people and, and put them in transit deserts, uh, but they are very costly operations and we made the decision to convert to a taxi operation that is flourished and we are able to actually provide that service at a most much lower cost. In a very innovative opportunity, uh, we partnered with a group called Beachside Buggies, where we're actually in, a beach si in beachside communities where we tried to run a seasonal uh, beach shuttle that was also not very productive, very costly to operate, and was seasonal. Now with Beachside Buggies, we have service throughout the entire year that is much more convenient, much more customer focused, and on demand, and at, at literally pennies on the dollar in terms of that operation. So new partnerships, new ways of thinking about doing business, and I think you heard Senator uh, Brandis talk about the work that we're doing with the U2C, what we like to call the ultimate urban circulator, and taking an antiquated automatic people mover monorail system and converting it to embrace autonomous vehicles and allowing us to expand from two and a half miles to a 10 mile downtown circulator system connecting neighborhoods using autonomous vehicles and leveraging technology that will be developing over the course of the next few years. So we are in an exciting time. I think Paul uh, sums it up. As somebody who's been in this industry nearly 40 years, this is an exciting time and I wish there was another 40 years ahead of me because I, I would love to be here to see this uh, change through the very final conclusions. So from infrastructure to technology to ridership modeling, uh, things are changing for all of us in our agencies. Our job as transit professionals and business leaders is to embrace this change, embrace this new mobility paradigm, and shift public transportation so that it continues to be sustainable, continues to be affordable, and continues to do what we do in terms of our communities. We have to continue to advocate for additional resources for our systems, prepare our workforce for the future. That goes without saying. How do we use data to help us make smarter decisions, faster decisions, and be more customer focused? We need to continue focusing on the safety and security of our customers and not allow cyber threats to handcuff us and hold us hostage periodically. And then finally, what is the roadmap for mobi mobility management going into the future? So if you're an agency that has begun a new project, let the information from this, uh, this session, from this uh, conference, help you as you transition through that project and develop it. And if you're looking for a way to begin, uh, here's the place to be. There's plenty of people in this room who are already working in this space and are ready to share their opportunities and their, and their knowledge with you. So if you're looking for a great way to start on your transition from a transportation authority to a mobility integrator, 
you're in the right place, you're here in Tampa, you're here at the APTA Bus and Paratransit Conference, let us help you. And so with that, I want to thank all of you for being here. Look forward to having an exceptional, an exceptional uh, APTA Bus and Paratransit Conference here in Tampa. And thank you to our hosts. Thank you.